1993, Solace the Amazon, December, 89. The boy had discovered that a life of making records could be hectic and sleazy. J.I. finally front the money to lay the demo, and after hooking up some shows at the mall, he made himself manager and further proved that they come in all shapes and sizes when he blamed his artist for their problems, at the same time he was using him to get richer. Again the boy went inward, spending every second preparing for his role as what Pythagoreans would call an episkopos in this game that life is. Fuck spitting that movement shit, dog. It's over. You're lost. Let me on the mic, real niggas. Keep it straight, gangster Mac. Like the goths before them, many West Coast Gs believed that to exercise the mind was to weaken the body. Nah, can't do that, said the boy. The main reason I'm in this is to school my niggas to the game. Plus, he'd heard J.I.'s flow. I thought we was in it to get paid, said J.I. Because that's the only reason I'm here, for my money. The boy ignored him and thought, see there. You know you fucked up, don't you? He chewed the inside of his lip. It was his tell in tense situations. J.I. realized he'd said too much and turned away. To many, the boy possessed that some sort of unnerving androgynous quality that's becoming of angels. A nearly six-foot svelte frame covered by even earthen pliable skin. His molded face was adorned by a puffy-lipped smile, centered by the glint of a golden Nefertiti, and topped by bushy brows that hovered like halos over angel eyes. It was all crowned by a curly high-top fade in hues of black and brown. Maybe we need to chill with this for a minute, said J.I. Let's see what these record companies are talking. I've been slacking, and me and my man's got a plan kicking major dust in Portland. The boy had expected this, but who was he to knock another brother's hustle? Maybe we do, but I must stick with making this microphone pay. J.I. put out his hand for a pound. Homies? The boy grasped it tight and pulled him close. Homies, partners, all that, man? Just call. I'm down to the E.N.D. It seemed that bad luck. The only friend that never let him down was paying him a visit again. In August, there was the incident in the alley, and by now both he and his 15-year-old sister had dropped out of school. To top that off, she was pregnant. Marion unable and unwilling to hide her affliction any longer, had come to town and gone. Aunt Audrey had her own problems to deal with, and in November she packed her things and left the kids with nothing but a note. It was December now, and Marion had yet to come back to claim her children. After the rift, J.I. went north on a come-up. Without his help, the children who were already living in squalor went from bad to worse, there were roaches in the toaster, roaches in an empty refrigerator, and a hot plate to make their only meals, usually rice and beans or ramen noodles. When it was time to sleep, they shared their linenless floors and cots with those same roaches. Cheris's boyfriend's family eventually took her in. Without her to look after, the boy threw himself into his music, doing whatever it took to get his name out there, including hanging out at after-school programs for the artsy crowd. There it was cool to bum food or money, recite verses, and flirt with the females. As hard as he tried, he'd yet to find another friend like his muse in Maryland. The closest he'd come was a soulful and talented dancer named Ananda. She was seventeen, chocolate chai, and passionate about her Afrocentricity. After days of running game, all his lines lad gone in one ear and out the other, until the sixteen he dedicated to the freedom political prisoner Nelson Mandela caught her attention. After the workshop, they got to know one another. Ananda pointed to the house. Thar's it right there. I appreciate you walking with me. Forget about it. I appreciate you letting me. What are you doing over the holiday break? I don't know. The weather was as inclement as it gets in the Amazon. Still, Ananda thought the boy looked cold and lonely. Well, where are you going now? she asked. I don't know, he said, chewing his lip. Against her better judgment, Ananda gave him a phone number. Go hang out somewhere for like thirty minutes, then call here. The lady I babysit for should be gone then, and you can come in for a while. The home was simple but comfortable, clean, warm and airy, a paragon of what the boy had always wanted for his family. This is nice. This lady's got good taste, but I thought you said she was white. She is. 
Why she got all this African stuff then? he asked, observing the paintings and Egyptian statues. Her husband is black, but she does the decorating. She's into all kinds of stuff you'd like her. In class she calls us her babies. She says she's got as many children as there are stars. She sounds cool. What they got to eat in here? Nothing fixed. I can cook if I want, but I never do. Why not? I don't cook. Ananda's voice was filled with entitlement. My mama takes care of all that. That's a damn shame. Let me see what's in here. The boy made himself at home in the kitchen. He fixed his specialty. Turkey tacos with big chunks of garlic. After the meal, Ananda put the child to bed early and started on her second helping while the boy looked over the family's bookcase. Damn, Ananda, your girl got some really good shit here. I read some of these books and the others I wanted to read, but I ain't had time for that lately. Ananda was licking her fingers. She barely heard him over her chewing. Um, hmm, these tacos are fire. Where did you learn how to cook? My old G taught me the basics. I picked up the rest myself. Is easy to learn when that's the only way you're going to eat. My stepfather lived in Mexico for a minute. He taught me that recipe there. It's the cumin. Where is your family now? Asked Ananda. Why don't you stay? Don't ask me about my past. It was all bad. Ananda respected his privacy, and there was an uncomfortable silence until the boy broke it with a question. You smoking? No, I'm babysitting. That baby is asleep. Come on, we'll go outside and blow this joint before I break out. It's not that late. You can stay a little longer. Mistaking her kindness for an invitation, he pushed up on her. Stop. What did I tell you? He scoffed. Man, I don't believe that shit. Well, you better get it through your big head she said as she opened the door. Back inside, Ananda relaxed, stretched out on the couch, and played with her twists while the boy massaged her feet and read, February 1932, from the diary of Anais Nin, L'amour das un taxi, the big woman, the small woman. Ananda was giggling. She blushed and grabbed at the book. Let me see it. That's not really in there. Yes, it is. I'm telling you this chick was live. She is crazy. Read some more, demanded Ananda, breathing heavy and fast. The boy read until they both lay absolutely still. Hours passed, and neither woke. The woman entered her home to find a strange male asleep in her living room. Warily, she made her way to the child's room. Safe. She followed her nose to the kitchen and found the dishes and stove clean. She unwrapped the leftovers and took a bite. Good. She thought on her way to wake the sitter. Ananda leapt to her feet, startled. Mehiel, what time is it? One thirty in the morning, her tone demanded an explanation. Oh, I'm sorry, said Ananda. Ah, uh, this is the boy I've been telling you about. She stepped on his foot to wake him. That's nice. Can you explain what he's doing in my house? Ananda hesitated as the boy introduced himself and tried to smooth things out. Please don't blame Ananda, Mrs. Abdul. It was bad out there tonight, and she was helping me by letting me rest here for a while. Straight up we were, doing nothing, just reading some of your books. You have some great books, by the way. Thank you, but I'm more interested in why you couldn't do that at your house. The animals have their caves, the birds of the sky have their nests, but the son of man has no place to rest his head. I guess you could say I'm a heretic too. Mehil looked at him curiously. Jesus said the same thing about himself. So did Khalil Gibran in that book you're reading. Mehil looked to the counter where the book was sticking out of her purse. You've read Spirits Rebellious? The boy arranged the words in his mind. What did he say? It is the answer for every man who wants to follow the spirit of truth in this age of falsehood, hypocrisy and corruption. The biggest of smiles came across Mehil's face. I told you he was something special, said Ananda. Turkish coffee kept the three awake and breaking down one subject or another until well into the morning. Mehir listened as the 18-year-old high school dropout critiqued a panoply of philosophers. Camus is my man, but Freud was a fag, and who cares what Nietzsche says, he was miserable. How you gonna tell me God is dead? Oh yeah, well kill yourself and find out for sure. Mihil explained to him how she got involved with the children's workshop. My mother was a love child. She was off into the San Francisco Haight-Ashbury scene. Tie-dye, Timothy Leary, 
Aldous Huxley, all that. When the wave broke, she washed up in L.A. where she met my father. Then I came along and we moved to an all-black neighborhood in Watts. This was after all the trouble and they still welcomed us. They gave me a nickname, Lady Me. My mother got really involved with the community and the movement all, you know, making the world a better place and all. The boy could relate. I know exactly what you mean. She was always gone somewhere or doing something like a little kid, said Mihiel. I swear, sometimes I feel like my father raised me and I raised her. I couldn't wait to be on my own. The boy spoke again. I know something about that one, too. My father wrote music, so there was always a bunch of artist types around. I must have been 12 or 13 when I learned the secret of artists. Do you know what it is? Nope. What is it? He wondered. Artists don't have secrets. They don't tell lies, and they live their lives in the open for all to see. Their work is from the spirit, and that makes it timeless. She continued talking, marinating the boy's brain in thought. As far as he could tell, Mehiel was a five-foot-one, 113-pound body of opposites, young but old, rich but poor, graceful as a gazelle, and at the same time lost as a sheep. Oh, I was totally gone when I lived in Manchester, she said, slapping her thigh. I couldn't find the fog, the beetles, or me. I sobered up and was like, where's California? That's when I came home and met Rich. We believe it's not enough to say you care. You've got to spread the word, or when you die, you'll come back again. Somehow it all seemed to work out for her. She was probably the most well-balanced person the boy had ever met. Look at the time. Come on, Ananda, let me get you home. Already Mehiel had found a special place in her heart for her new baby. There was no way she was sending him back to the streets. You stay here and watch the baby. The boy couldn't find the words. He showered her with thanks as she found him some linens and things. Thanks so much, Mrs. Abdul, and thanks for believing me when I told you we weren't doing nothing. What? I was never worried about that. She and Ananda giggled as they walked out the door. Ananda's not interested in boys. That morning when they woke, Mehiel phoned Rich and smoothed things over with him. The boy displayed his full range of domestic skills, performing all the tasks you wouldn't expect from a teenager, though his foremost role in the coming weeks would be that of Mehiel's assistant. His knowledge, wordplay and minor celebrity being the link she needed to express her ideas of education and love of the arts to her youthful audience. But all that ended when her husband came home. Hey baby, it's so good to see you. How was the tour? asked Mihiel. Good sweetheart, he kissed her. Really nice. How's everything here? Great. The baby's at daycare. She missed her daddy. Come here. Rich, I'd like you to meet the young man I told you about. Rich was intimidating, tall and dark as onyx with big eyes, dreads and a slight belly. He made the boy back to fuck up when they shook hands. Rich stayed quiet for a long time, just listening as he did all the talking. So what kind of band you play in? I'm a percussionist, said Rich. I specialize in African music. Oh, I'm more into hip-hop. They're one and the same to me. What they're doing now is the same as African tribes used to do to communicate and celebrate with each other. It's just smoothed out on the rhythm tip with a pop feel to it. Our music is mentally hip-hop, smoothed out on the R&B tip with a pop feel appeal to it. The boy gave him some dap. I like that. That's catchy. So Mehiel says you're an urban poet. Let me hear something. Man, you gonna put me on the spot just like that? Aight, I got something for you. He opened up and recite a couple of special rhymes that he'd written to be said only for the righteous and in the depths of solitude. Rich clapped. I like that man. I'm feeling it. I'm feeling it. I got a good feeling about you. You're on your way. The Amazon, 1990. An obtuse and emaciated Marion arrived just before the new year, causing the boy all kinds of pain and confusion seeing her so weak. His hero, the queen of the movement, who taught him to forever be strong and never give up, now seemingly welcomed her own defeat. The sight of her drained his energy. Random imagery caused him to lose focus. He couldn't deal with those emotions now. He was chasing his dream. A few more pixels and he could touch it putting to use the skills he'd perfected here. 
he inured his heart of glass to one of stone before diving headfirst into the river of Lethe, that fabled river that leads both the weak and the strong into an immense heart of darkness. After less than a week, he spent his last dime on her bus ticket to her sister's home in New York. During rare moments of levity, he wondered if he'd ever see her face again. Not the mask she wore to hide the truth neither of them could accept, but her real face, the one that he remembered as a child like Maria, full of grace. His adopted family did their best to keep him positive. Rich had been planning something special. This day, they glide into Studio 617 on a funk mob bass line as rich and smooth as molasses. Whoa, is that your band bumping the bass? Rich looked at him and moved his head to groove. You ever heard of the group Subway? Yeah, but I ain't never heard nothing that funky. Rich and Mehiel smiled. They're recording their new disc, My Band Records, next door. They asked me if I wanted to fill in on a few tracks. I said, cool. Then I mentioned you. You got a meeting with their manager right now. This is it. The rest is up to you. Rich parked the car, and the boy gave them both big hugs when they got out. Subway's manager, A-Train, met them at the car. How you doing, Rich? You ready to do the damn thing? Always, Rich held up his sticks. This is my wife, Mehiel, and over there peeking in your studio is the guy I was telling you about. The group walked to the door where the boy stood with his mouth open, watching the crew of Subway get naughty, squeezing and kissing a bevy of blow-up dolls. What about you, Trooper? You ready? The answer was in his eyes. You want me to spit a few bars? He asked. A train chuckled. I like this kid, he said. I listened to your demo. We'll get to that later. For now, you think you can handle one of them hotties on stage, because chat's what we really need. It's not glamorous, and it doesn't pay much. But, man, I feel blessed that I got the chance. This is my passion. I'ma do it whether I'm paid or not. Mehiel rubbed the boy's back. Good, said A-Train. Then it's a done deal. He pointed to some of the other members. That funny-looking dude over there is G-Train. The short guy is B-Train and I'm A-Train. Welcome aboard. We're the freaks of the industry. The Lower Astral Plane Storm clouds rumbled in the realm of illusion. The cries of misbegotten entities with bloodshot eyes compete with the roar of the sea. On the shore bells tinkled throughout the Great Hall as the Lords of Karma came forth to greet. Hey, one more time. I'ma take a journey through life so I can see how I landed here. If home is heaven, and this ain't, I got some big choices to make. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. That's too much work. Mad dough, truck chains, fat asses. Yeah, playboy, that's how Ima live. Fuck that bitch. He heard about them cats. They went out of town and blew up. Then a few months later, bodies started showing up. You're cool out here for a few. I'm a talk some business with my man. You on the team now. You'll be there. And so I am. Shit seems obvious now. Can it be that I was so simple then? Has time rewritten the pages of my mind? What if I had the chance to do it all again? How would? First home is where the heart is. Patience is a virtue. Nothing is ever too much except in matters of materialism. The future's not ours to see. Honor thy mother. Thou shalt not kill. I should have listened to Ais that day outside the barber shop. That shit was real. Okay, so it was the end of 89, and I'm knee-deep in the crack game. We, knee-deep in it, the whole Young Guns crew, everybody getting paid. Sporting waves and gazelle frames him. Somehow the cops always knew where to go. Other dealers was getting popped off left and right, and we was getting all they customers. We had the avenue sewed up. What ain't never wait for work. Soon as we got low, we just hit A.D. on the hip, and abracadabra, we had whatever we needed. Playboy A.D. That nigger wasn't never hurting. Even in the middle of a drought, he was the only one with work. Hmm. I could have been large like that. I should have listened to him. Brooklyn, 1989. Fat chrome anteras hydroplaned on the slushy asphalt as the jet black 850i cruised down Fulton. It stopped at Thomas's stoop. Victor jogged up to it, peering through the tint. You're who the fuck driving this? The invisible man. Julius laughed as the window came down slow. Oh, you old niggers chill, it's A.D. Thomas got up and went to the car. 
Victor continued mean-mugging as the other commoners hung back admiring the king's chariot. Oh, the ruler's back, said Thomas. Mo fucker, we ain't heard from you in over a month, where you disappear to playboy, shopping for whips. A.D. gave him a pound. Maintaining. I've been a prisoner of circumstance, he said, eyeing Victor. You got a new shooter? That's my nigger Vic, the one it's holding them burners for. Nigger just came home, nowhere to stay, trying to get on. He'll have the paramedics talking slow and breathing soft on him. You know that, what's your name, where you from, who shot your shit? A.D. looked ahead, rubbing his chin. Right, what'd it be like over here? We've been made quota. I was gonna hit Theo tonight. You want it now? Nah, nah, go ahead and do that. I was just passing through. I heard it's been hot around here. You got enough heat? Thomas laughed. Do we? We got seven Mac 11s, around 838s, 99s, 10 Mac 10s. The heat don't end. My crib looked like Arnold's in commando. Oh, AD gave him a pound. I nigger remember the seventh commandment. Seventh comma? Thomas caught himself and smiled as AD pulled off. That's where I failed. Two weeks later, 5 kicked my door down talking about where are the weapons. Mom's damn near had a heart attack. My fuckers drags the nigger outside in his drawers and socks. But I wasn't sweating it. My first time getting popped, they aimed but two guns. No bodies on them. But all the money I had stacked went to bail and was still a couple hundred short. Mom's put it up. She posted and didn't even wait for me. I ain't have no dough. I had to walk all the way home from central booking. That's when the real trouble started. When I get home, Sinatra is playing and all my shit is packed. Brooklyn, 1989. Thomas, I'm sick. I can't take this no more. You got to go. I don't have no place to go, ma. A mother's work lasts a lifetime, and for single mothers, it's two. The years had taken their toll on Gaeta. She deserved some help and a companion. As questions of mortality began invading her thoughts, she cringed when she realized the one she'd invested in may have bore bitter fruit. That's not my problem. I'm tired. I don't know what to do with you no more. You don't listen. You do the fool ting and drop out of school to hang in the steel. You want to be grown? It's time for you to go den. All my years in the States and me own son be the one to bring trouble through my door. Call your pie PA. Go hang out with the riffraff there. I just want you gone, Thomas. Why are you always doing this to me? Thomas asked grievingly. Don't blame me. You do this to yourself. You choose this life. So did you, Ma. I took my shit and stayed at Julius's for a few days. The twins had moved and them niggas said Nicks went for twenties down in the Tar Heel stair. Huh. I hit AD. He gave me a little something on consignment and I hopped a bus. Power move. I'm down there in the triangle for like two weeks trying to be rich instead of seem it. That's all the time it took for them people to get to know my face. Popped again. I sat there for a spell before I got extradited to NY on a VOP. I ain't gone lie. Hearing the slam of that great steel gate kind of set my ass straight. I think. My celly was this motherfucker named Rumi. He didn't talk much. His head was forever stuck in a book. One morning I asked him what he'd learned from all that reading. He answered, The paths are different, but the goal is one. Whatever. But something about that shit stuck with me. It couldn't go back to sleep. I picked up a book he had on numerology. 60 sixties, equal one, 24 of those equal one, 30 or so of those, one, and 12 of those. I wasn't even trying to see that one. But I was getting closer to it. Wholeness, God and the universe. All that thinking had my head hurting. Rumi said I should try the spiritual exercises. I never did. I wasn't on the working out tip because of my asthma. So El got my college education on. I leaned how to mix dip and hooch, make shivs, fly kites, give tats, draw murals, stretch grams, all that. But I couldn't stop counting. It was 1,860 holes in my steel bunk. 415 bricks on the walls of our hut and 66 bars on the date to it. I hadn't seen the world in 208 six days. Then on the 287th one. Rikers Island, 1990. Open C-74, Nice. Thomas's body lay in the bing, his eyes open and facing the ceiling. Wake your ass up, Mr. Nice, yelled the turnkey. Let's go. Thomas heard his mother sing, 
Think, plot, plan, dream, make, write, dance, sing. I love you, Thomas. Leave the riffraff alone and focus on being king. Thomas blinked and swallowed before he answered. I'm wide awake. Allow me to walk you to the door, said the CEO. So how you feel leaving us? Come on, Duke. What kind of dumbass question is that, man? I'm trying to get the fuck up out this joint, yo. Yeah, yeah, we'll see you again. It's just a matter of time. Go ahead, Lon know what you on, but you won't see me in this move fucker no more. Y'all niggas get ready. I got big plans. They gon' call me. King of Kings. Brooklyn, June. 93. Thomas had yet to be crowned, and his college education had lasted about as long as it took him to smoke his first L. Back on his block it was all the same, only some names had changed, but at home, Gaeta was smiling, and her reasons gave Thomas something to smile about. The bright white limousine cruised down Fulton, stopping at Thomas's stoop. Victor jogged up to it, peering through the tint. That nigger A.D. done snapped, yelled Julius. The window slid down, and he mean mugged the middle-aged chauffeur with the thick accent. Hey, buddy, any of you guys know where I can find the kid? Victor stood in his usual spot. Who the fuck is asking? A cloud of smoke spiraled from the sunroof. Through it, a genie-like head and body appeared. Tell him it's his motherfucking homeboy from last night. Victor dropped his gun. Oh, shit. The kid took his headphones off, dropped his rhyme book, and rushed the car with a huge smile. Mr. Postman, what the fuck is you doing around my way? What? You thought I was on some bullshit, nigger? I told you I was coming through. J.I. stepped out of the limo to greet Thomas with a fifth of Hennessy in hand. The boy followed him, their necks, wrists, and fingers heavy with old-school jewels, two scintillating figures dancing in the eyes of the seniors who peeked through their windows at the commotion as the hood went crazy. Little kids ran up calling the boy's name. Sisters gave him kisses and thugs gave him pounds. Some even asked for autographs as Thomas introduced his new friends to his old ones. I told you bed got love for you, he said. The boy was happy to be back. Good, cause I ain't got nothing but love for them, all of New York. This shit remind me of the old school baby. I remember getting fresh in my shell toes and lees and getting blitzed off tra bags with too many seeds. Hopping the turnstile to get to the party. Red alert on the wheels, Ricky D singing la di da di, and when them niggas would shout, it's Brooklyn in the house, and throw up they hood signs, move fuckers from Park Hill to Brownsville would lose they goddamn mind. Thomas knew that feeling too. I came through the door, said it before, the boy shouted, yo, that was the shit. But as we turn the page to 1993, added Thomas, niggas is Gertrude smoked G, believe me. In minutes, J.I. and the others had killed the fifth. Yo, kid, where the store at? We need some mohen, he yelled. And some weed, too, added the boy. Shilt, I'm here to kick in. Where the yamps at? Thomas ordered Victor to hold down the fort and told Julius to run and tell Tootie he'd be right back. Tootie, who is that? Is that charwoman? asked the boy as they entered the car. Julius looked Thomas's way and laughed as he and J.I. traded war stories. Nah, said Thomas, that's just a little hoochie I gassed up. I told her she could be lieutenant. I got her upstairs babysitting my daughter. Thomas gave the chauffeur the destination, and they pulled off. You got a shorty? asked the boy. Yeah, dog, I wouldn't be out here no more if it wasn't for her. I got too much to lose. Dizzy keeps screaming, hold on like he on vouge and shit, but lil mama can't eat no promises. I feel that. He ain't look like he was hurting at all. My guy Roberto said his label is about to blast off. How'd you all get together? Thomas was on ten, laughing as the limo darted in and out of traffic. Man, that shit right there was crazy. You know how jail changes a nigger. I mean, they had me scared straight. I wasn't even steaming. Soon as I got home, I started writing. I was in my room for months just writing and fucking. Then my girl hit me with the news. I told Mum Duke I had a shorty on the way, and she started bugging again. So I started hanging out in Mecca with the nation just to get out of the crib. It's some cool brothers there. We'd leave the parliaments and go freestyling at all the spots. I was at the tunnel like fucking every night. You know Peter Parker, don't you? The DJ? Yeah, that's my nigger. He got a juicy little sister named Sassy. 
She don't stay too far from here. We should slide through there. But anyway, Pete liked my shit. He told me to make a tape and he put it out there. That blew me up. He gave it to dude at the source and this fly chick named Mycha. Mycha got a baby by Dizzy. She liked it. She laid the tape on that nigger and let him know shit was real. Thomas exhaled hard. Huh, I ain't gon' lie. Playboy came through in a nick of time. I was close to saying fuck the world, my moms and my girl. Desperation breeds inspiration. Yeah, it be like that sometimes, said the boy. The rapport on Nostrand and St. John's was the same as on Fulton. There the boy surprised them all when he bought out the spot and wanted more. Next, the limousine stopped near Franklin and Dean at the corner. Yellow tape preserved a crime scene. White chalk and brains all over the sidewalk, while detectives questioned witnesses who refused to talk. I swear, I don't know what he looked like, officer. All I know is he had a gun. You want to play games, asshole? You can play them all day in jail. Let's go. Man, you're on bullshit. What's the charge? I'll think of one. The rest of you get the fuck off this corner. This is my corner now. That's ill, said Thomas. Let's see what happened. Thomas led the boy around back to a trench where the soldiers had dug in. Yo, somebody's coming. Multiple guns cocked. Yo, niggas chill, said Thomas coolly. It's me. Oh, what's up, kid? You almost caught a hot one, playboy. Oh, shit. Look who this nigger got with him. The boy bought out another spot while Thomas got the scoop from his man. He he had a hood on, but we know who it was. He leaned in and spoke lightly in Thomas's ear. There was surprise on Thomas's face when he glanced at the boy who was busy counting out the dealer's money. Back in the limo, Thomas questioned him. How you and Roberto hook up? At a party in Miami last summer, him and them Carol City cartel niggas is so major out there they had me wondering how I could be down. We hung out. He introduced me to some of his boys, a flashy lil nigger named Thomas finished his sentence. Trenny. Yeah, you heard of him? Every live nigger in NY done heard of Trenny. This time the boy read Thomas's face. I know about Trenny and Glover, said the boy. I know how them niggers do. Thomas looked relieved. Long as you know, cause word is they get shady, baby. I know. What about Dizzy? Right. So dear pulls up in a black vet of banging the tape. Me and my nigger Othello were sitting on the stoop. I'm trying out some new rhymes on him, and Deer hops out the car looking spooked. Othello was like, Who is this scary-ass nigger? I'm like, Yo, dude, where you get my tape? I swear the nigger's eyes got bigger saucers when he seen me. He was like, That's you? Yo, let me holler at you, B. That when Othello peeped the youth authority jacket he was wearing and flipped the fuck out. I'll never forget how hyped he was, jumping around screaming, Oh, shit. My nigga finna get signed. It's about to go down. We ain't gotta sell this shit no more. It's over. We about to be on some real shit. After Dizzy got over how I looked, we hit it off. He said my flow was so smooth, it sounds like I'd be singing instead of rapping. That flow is unbelievable, thought the boy. Maybe better than mine. He gave me his card, and I signed with YA the next week. The boy lit a blunt and gave it to Thomas. That shit felt good, didn't it? It did. For like a second. Thomas took a long pull. Othello and his people was hurting. He had two kids. His sister had four and she was on the pipe. When Diz came through, he'd already planned to make a move down south on some come up shit. He left that next day. The day I signed with YA, I ran home to hear him with the news. That's when his cousins told me he had got moped out that morning. That shit fucked me up. Thomas threw back a big gulp of cognac and looked away. I wanted to tell him to stay here, but you know how that go? One man can't eat off another's man's dream. I miss my nigger, though. The boy let the windows down on both sides. Well, don't let the liquor get like that. Tip that shit over. Thomas followed his lead as they both poured out more than a lit Hennessy. I went through that with a couple of my homies in Cali. I think everyone is every hood have. Motherfuckers don't understand how it is when your man is lying on the pavement twisted. They don't know. That happened over a year ago, and Dizzy say my shit ain't dropping until next year. We've been putting my name out there. He'll throw me a lil' paper when he can, or when we do a show. Hey, good looking on letting me rock the mic last night. Man, fuck that, said the boy. 
I'm getting money. He went in his pocket and gave Thomas a G. And I want all my niggas to get it with me. Is enough of that shit for everybody to eat. I heard that. They traded pounds. So, asked Thomas, what's up, nigger? What's your story? You got albums, movies, you on TV? Shit, you got politicians talking about you. That punk can eat a dick. He ain't do nothing but blow my name up. The movie thing. I just fell into that. My man B-Train was going to this audition. I went with him and ended up getting the part. Since then, everybody's been throwing roles at me, but I've been busy trying to stay out of jail. These bitches got me crooked in all 50 states. Thomas knew about all the cases. He was a regular in the tabloids. I know, sometimes I hear bitches shitting on you like, he got all that money, why he keep doing stupid shit? I can't stand fake ass bitches like that, said the boy angrily. They act like I'm trying to go to jail. You know I got a price on my head? Yeah, Thomas replied calmly. It's the price of fame. The boy realized he was right, and Thomas asked, Fuck them, how you get in the game? The boy told the chauffeur to drive around bed and waste a little time. Then with no hesitation, he went straight into his past. You know about my mother and all that, right? Just the little bit they said in the magazine article. She seems mad cool. Man, don't get me started. My mama smoked so damn much. Anyway, Pops was a joke. I used to find dope in his coat, and they would always tell me not to smoke. We ain't have shit, no money, no car. Me and my little sister never did nothing or went nowhere. Around 84, I started sneaking out, smoking and doing graffiti. Just little shit like that. Shit didn't really get ugly till I got to Maryland. It was all these dumb shitty niggas that was always trying me because I was skinny and on some different shit. The only thing I miss about there was the school I went to. We was doing all kinds of shit. That's where I got the acting bug. If I could have stayed there, I might have been okay. You know what I mean? Thomas shook his head. Yeah. Why you leave? He asked. The boy took a deep breath and expelled what had been eating at him for so long. It was this one nigger stayed on Decatur whenever he seen me he had some thing to say. One day I'm coming out the crib walking to the bus stop with this chick if was fucking wit. This nigger sitting across the street on the porch popping shit and trying to holler at her. I'm thinking, damn I'ma have to go over there and square off with all these mew fuckers. Then old girl just run up on their porch and set it off. Called dude all kinds of punks and trick bitches. Now all his homies and they girls is straight clowning him. What they do to your girl? Nothing. We got on the bus and I rode her home. The boy smiled. You seen her too? Who is it? The boy shook his head. Never kiss and tell. Are oh, you going to do your boy like that? Asked Thomas jokingly. Was it the one from last night? Petula? Nah, I'll tell you about her later. So when I get back around the crib, I see these niggas in the gas station and dude is talking big shit now. He mad than a move fucker, he got punked by a girl. So he run up on me and smacks me in the face. Bitch move. Right. So I grabbed a screwdriver off the wall and go after this nigger. His boys held me back while his bitch ass ran away. That's some bullshit. I know, but it was my fault. How? Cause I had fucked around and got soft. That school had me thinking shit was sweet. After that, I ain't never leave the crib without my strap. You ever see the nigger again? The boy paused. He and the kid were eye to eye. You know it. That's when I moved to Cali. What's it like out there? Shit. The streets out there are death row. These other niggas is copycats. Bloods and Crips is G's. They got blocks so hot the police won't go on them out there. If they on you and you get to that street, you made it cause they ain't coming on that motherfucker. Not without backup and some riot gear. Thomas smiled and passed him the L before urging. So how you get in the game? My homie J.I. hooked us up a demo, and we promoted it for a minute. Then, met this white girl. Her husband got me an audition with them subway niggers. I went all around the world touring with them. They manager became my manager. We did another demo. He sent it to the people at Periscope, and they called. Damn, I should have been sending out demos then. Wait, though. The boy elbowed the kid. This the crazy part. Them niggers wasn't even listening to my disc. One of Periscope's owners, this super rich white boy, his daughter was going through the bullshit bin listening to discs. She was the one who liked it, so they signed me off that. How did the daughter look? 
Did you hit that? Nah, nigga, she was like 14. Damn. Dizzy always saying it be them goody-goody white girls who love our shit. He right. That's why when you put your single out, you always put out something for the bitches. Cause niggas buy what bitches want to hear. But I don't know a nigga that don't love your shit. I've been telling motherfuckers you the realest nigga in the game. The boy thanked him with a pound. Yo, what's the deal with the one from last night? Same thing we was just talking about. Little rich girl, just got to college, studying communications. Her and her girls sneak to the club to hang out. You know who her daddy is? Who? Thomas's eyes were as hungry as those in the limo's rear view. The boy leaned doser and answered him. What? Guess who a man is? Thomas was all ears as the boy whispered again. Thomas yelled, Slow down, baby, not Mr. Goodbar. Nigger, you better ask somebody. She came at me like, you know, blasey, blah. And I'm like, he cool with me. She said, that's my man. And I'm like, oh, he's smart enough to have you, but dumb enough to let you out? Thomas laughed loudly. Man, I got the details on that buster, said the boy. Dude, be straight dog and he's punching her, throwing around the house, locking her up in his grandma's basement. Yeah, he seems like that type of guy. So I'm on her like, what's the deal, baby? Because I only got one night in town. Can you get away? We get to her hotel room and she throw on R. Kelly's 12 play. I'm drinking. She rolling. Thomas asked a totally unrelated question. He had to know. What's up with R. Kelly and that little girl? The boy threw his hands in the air. Oh no, man. He like us. Still young trying to figure it all out. Nigger need to ask heaven for a hug, though. But the hoes love that nigger. Ooh. So you drinking she's rolling? Or you ain't gotta say no more? I saw how she was on you. What you do with her? Just kept it real. Put that thug passion in her. They laughed and gave each other dap. Stick with me, kid. I'ma help get you through this shit. Thomas went against the third commandment when he invited him to the spot where he rest at. They pushed open the door and entered the 36 chambers. Excerpt 47. That nigga won, guy. Word up. Look out for the cops, though. Cash fruit. Word up. Two for fives over here, baby. Word up. Two for fives. Some niggas got garbage down the way. Word up. Cash you know fruit. Everything around me. Cream it. Yeah. Check this old fly shit out. Word up. Cash Stick fruit. You everything the around joint. me. Cream get the here money. We, here we go. Dollar, Check dollar, this bill, shit. Yeah. The second they were in, Julius screamed. Yo, kid, the pie's still wet. We can't bag yet. I'ma stick them in the microwave and fuck it up like you did last time. Nah, use the hairdryer. Yo, said the boy turning up the radio. I love these niggas for 93. Julius asked who else he listened to and soon everybody joined in and represent you all probably ain't heard of this MC, said Thomas. But I got to represent for my man, the prophet. He's coming. Chemis. In the sands of the two lands, a prophet rest osmosis in Ka. The coming of Ra would mark the twentieth anniversary of this, his born day, and the start of the night journey back his phylum in the Valley of the Dead. His hunger for knowledge quelled by history from the papyrus of any, his thirst for wisdom quenched by waters from the river Nile, his nature once heavy, uplifted by the angel's gift of solace. Have we not caused thy bosom to dilate and eased thee of the burden which weighed down thy back and exalted thy fame? But lo, with hardship goeth ease, lo, with hardship goeth ease. So when thou art relieved, still toil and strive to please thy Lord.